Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to talk about a portfolio with multiple assets and how we can balance the weights on the portfolio to achieve the or identify the efficient frontier with the assets on hand. What we have here is a series of prices, stock prices. We have different companies on top and SPY represents the market. That's the EFT from the S&P 500 and uh, you can get that data online as well. So we're gonna need the stock prices of the companies we're gonna be using in our portfolio. And in order to properly diversify the portfolio, we're gonna need the data from the market as well. Okay, so these dates are obviously old, but what we have here is monthly data over a few years. And these are just the stock prices, not the returns yet. So by just having the change in prices, we have all the information we need to build a well or to balance a portfolio and diversify to the best of our ability. So the first thing we're gonna need is the stock returns. These are the prices, we need the stock returns. So we're gonna start here because we need the previous price and the latest price per date in order to get the stock returns. So we'll start as simple as the new price divided by the old price minus one. And we're just gonna go ahead and drag it this way and it will work. And then we can drag it all the way down. And that will give us all the stock returns we need. For this uh, exercise. Okay, so now we have the returns. We don't have to worry about these stock prices anymore. From this point on, we're going to be using these numbers. Over here, we're going to fill out these tables in order to get the data that we need to eventually be able to work with the, the tool in Excel that will allow us to identify the optimal weights. Okay, we have a couple of select formulas here and I'll explain them as we go. Let me bring it a little closer so we can see it. Let's do that. Okay, so first thing we want to do, we want to get the average returns. We want to get the average returns that we just calculated for the entire period. So we are going to use the average function in Excel. And this is Walmart. So we go ahead and select the returns, not the price, the returns. Wow. Once we have them all there, that is our average returns for the entire period. And we can go ahead and just drag it like that as well. And it would work. Now for variance, we also have a function in Excel we're going to use to make our life easy. So if I start typing variance, you'll notice a few options. For this exercise, we're going to use variance or var.p, all right? And the same thing, just use the variance of the returns. And that is the variance of the returns for that stock. 
So you can just drag it as well. Now a standard deviation, as you know, is just a square root of the variance. So that is the standard deviation. Now the standard deviation is also known as total risk. Total risk is your systemic risk plus your unsystemic risk. And now we have that data and that information that we can use later on. Now, we're also gonna need the covariance between uh, the, the market and the given, any given stock. So in Excel, we also have a function to make our life easier instead of having to calculate it. Covariance, in this case, since we're using the dot P, that's what we're gonna stick with. Now, the way it works is that you want to do the stock with the market, all right? So we take, I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, the stock with the market. So we're going to take the Walmart returns as the first array. And then I'm going to put a comma there so I can work with the second array. And now we're talking about the market returns. So we had Walmart returns first, the stock of Walmart. And now we have the returns for the market there. Now, because I'm going to use the market for all of them, I'm going to lock in the market piece. And that is the covariance between Walmart and the market. So when I drag in now, after I locked it in, you're going to see the covariance for each one of them against the market. Now, I went ahead and wrote down here the covariance of the market with the market. This is just to show you how, since when you do the covariance with itself, it's just equals to the variance. So in this case, as we did, the market against the market, the number you have here, this is in percentage, this is in decimals, but it's the same number. Now, when this is done market against each one of the stocks, then the numbers are not the same. Now, let's go ahead and use the information we have here to calculate the beta of each one of these uh, stocks. So we're going to use this formula you see here. So this formula that you see here is just telling you, I know these symbols look the same. I'm sorry, I don't make the rules. But the top one means the covariance of the stock with the market, which is what we calculated here. The bottom part is the variance of the market, which is this number here. So all we do is we take that covariance of Walmart with the market divided by the variance of the market. And I will lock that one in place so I can drag it. And that is the beta for Walmart, according to this data we have here. Now notice, as you have heard before, the market beta is always one. So even when you calculate it this way, you'd still get that market beta of one. And these are the betas we just calculated. Now, the unsystematic risk, this is where this formula here comes in play. All right, so this formula gives us the unsystematic portion. Now, we'll, we'll have to take the square root of it. We'll have to take the square root because you notice how that part has a, has a, still has squared on it. So we'll do the formula and then take the square root. So what we do is, we start by with the square root. So we need the variance of the stock we're looking at. So we're going to look at the variance of Walmart. Minus the beta of Walmart squared. 
So we take that and we're going to square it. Multiplied by the variance of the market. And that one we're going to lock in as well so we can drag the formula. So that is our unsystematic risk. Now, before I drag the formula, let's do a quick calculation for the systemic risk. We said earlier that standard deviation represents total risk, which is this plus this. Unsystemic plus systemic equals total risk. So if you want the systemic risk, all we do is we take the total risk minus the unsystemic portion, and that gives us the systemic risk. So what we do now here is we can drag it and it gives us all the numbers that we need. Now let's go ahead and do a quick fix here. You see, and I'll explain this why that looked funny and I'm going to limit the square root portion. The market, market risk is the same as saying systemic risk. So any risk the market has is just systemic. So it would have zero risk by nature. So the market does not have unsystemic risk, and that's why that zero is there. Now, the reason it had the error was because Excel gets a little confused on doing the square root of zero if you have it in a, in a formula, like the way we had it. But the message is the market clearly has zero unsystemic risk. The market only has systemic risk, and that's how this reflects here. Now, these are not necessary to calculate because I already have the numbers around, but it's just to show you how all these things are related. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the weights. Now, the weights, it's what we're going to calculate. We're going to use the solver in Excel to calculate the, the necessary weights we need on these portfolios in order to uh, diversify it or, or make it as efficient as possible. So before we actually put in there here, I'm going to mark here total and I explain why this is important. All these, when you add them together, so let me do it this way. The sum of the weights will have to be 100%. And we'll talk about that in a minute because we're not going to be doing short sales. So we need to have that there so we understand that if I put a percentage of money here, a percentage of money here, a percentage of money here, here and here, I need to know the total percentage. Now, this is not going to become, I guess, too much of an issue in this exercise we're doing because we're not going to be doing short selling. But in a more advanced portfolio class, when we do short selling, this becomes very important. Okay. Now, before we get into filling these out with a function, let's go ahead and set some, uh, the last few formulas that we need to get this working together. Now, this is the portfolio. Now, to get the average return of the portfolio, it's a simple weighted average. So all we have to do is we take whatever the weight that is gonna show up there later, and it's going to be multiplied by the return, the average return of that stock. Right, right now, clear showing zero because we don't have an assigned weight. But that's what's going to happen once we have those numbers in there, which will be the final step we're going to do. All right. And we can go ahead and just do that. Allow me one second because it's a weighted average. So we start with Walmart times the weight of Walmart plus this stock, the weight or whatever that is going to be times the return on the stock, the average return on the stock plus whatever weight we get there times the average return of that stock. And then we'll just continue doing that.
They invariant for the formula, weight times average return, weight times average return, weight times average return, weight times average return, and so on. Okay. For standard deviation on the portfolio, unfortunately, we cannot do something as simple as uh, weight times standard deviation. So there are many ways to calculate it, but we're going to use this. This is a variance of the portfolio formula, so we need a square root of this. So we'll go ahead and use this formula, but with the square root. Now it's going to be lengthy because this sum here is going to include all of these. So the first piece is the square root that we want, right? Because even though it doesn't show square root here, there's a variance formula. We're going to take the square root to end up with the standard deviation of the portfolio. So we need the beta of the portfolio squared. Now I know we don't have the beta calculated here yet, but we will. We will be using the beta of the portfolio. It's going to be squared. And then we're going to be using the variance of the market, which is this one here. Did I get off the formula? I'm sorry, okay. Multiplied by the variance of the portfolio. Let me do this so it's in here, okay. It's better this way. Okay, so we have the beta squared of the portfolio multiplied by the variance of the market. Beta squared of the portfolio multiplied by the variance of the market. That is this first piece here. Now we're going to put a plus sign there because now we're going to start adding down the line. So now we are going to use We're going to use the unsystematic risk that you see here, but that's going to be squared, all right? So what you see here on the right, this all uh, sigma squared EI is similar to what you see here. So we're going to square the unsystematic risk. And each one of those will be multiplied by the squared of the weight. Okay. So let's start here with the weight. So I'm going to have the weight and it's going to be squared and it's going to be multiplied by the unsystematic risk of the stock and that's going to be squared as well. Okay, now because this is a sum, I have to keep on adding them. So again, weight squared times the unsystematic risk squared plus the weight squared times the unsystematic risk squared plus the weight squared times unsystematic risk squared plus the weight squared times the unsystematic risk squared. And that's our last one. We don't do the market one in this in, inside this formula. Now, let me just take a quick look at the formula to make sure that I am in the right place here. Okay, that squared, that squared, plus that squared, that squared, plus that squared times that squared. Okay, nope. I missed a square somewhere here. Right there. There should be a squared in there too.
Okay, I think we have it right now. We'll find out soon enough if the numbers don't come out. Okay. Now, coefficient of variation, that's a number we like to have around. And that's just simple as standard deviation divided by the returns. Now we're gonna get an error message because we have a zero, but that will populate soon enough. Now for beta, we can use the, the same as we did with returns. We can do a weighted beta for the portfolio. So how you do it, it's gonna be the weight of one of the stocks times the beta of that stock. All right, and then we're gonna go ahead and add it together. Weight times the beta plus weight times the beta plus weight times the beta plus weight times the beta. And that's how you can calculate the portfolio beta. It's just a weighted average of the betas. Now let me go ahead and look at my numbers again to make sure the formula is right. Hold on one second. Okay. All right, looks good. And now we're finally ready to start finding out how we're gonna get these weights. Now the simplest form is to use the solver in Excel. If you do not have the solver, you can just go to Excel options and there's a place there will, act, will, will pop it up here. Uh, if you're not sure how to go through the options to get the solver, if you just Google Excel solver, install, and I'll show you how you can just act. It, it doesn't really install, you're just activating it. But when you go here to solver, you're gonna see this tool here. Now, the first thing we want to do to build the efficient set of portfolios, which will give you the efficient frontier, the Markowitz efficiency line, you want to get the lowest standard deviation without a negative return. So you want your returns to be positive, but with the lowest standard deviation possible. This is how you do it. See, it says here, set objective. I'm going to delete that so you see what I'm doing. Set objective. My objective is standard deviation because that's the, 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 the part that I want to lower as much as possible while maintain positive returns. So that's why I select here between maximum, minimum, or a specific value, I'm going to set it to minimum. Okay, so I'm going to set it to minimum. So it's going to minimize the standard deviation. Now it's asking, I'm just going to go ahead and delete this. It's already pre-filled, but I was working on it earlier. It's going to say, okay, so to minimize this, which variables you want me to change? Well, we want to change these here. Those are the ones that are going to be changing. And then it's going to ask you, are there any limitations or constraints to be aware of? And it says, well, yes. Here, where you see, let me go ahead and not do the whole thing. Let me delete it. There's one constraint that we uh, are concerned with for this example, which is the simplest one. This total can only be 100% because you're not borrowing money. So if you have a million dollars, you can only spend the million dollars. You cannot go above it. So, but then you'd split that million dollars in different percentages across the different stocks here. So the point is that no matter what percentage you put here, it can only add up to 100% because that's the maximum amount of money you have. So what we're gonna say is we're gonna add a constraint. We're gonna tell it. This here, this total, so I selected it and it shows here on the cell reference. This total has to be equal to 100%. 
Now we're gonna say 100% equal exactly because we have, we're gonna say that we must use all the money. Okay, we must use all the money. You cannot use less. So we must use all the money. So whenever we allocate the money, it has to be all spent to 100%. You hit OK, and now it shows up here. So to recap, the set objective is a standard deviation. We want to minimize it. We're going to allow it to change the cells in blue. But we need those cells in blue to add up to 100%. And as we said, that cell has to equal 100%. Now, this check mark here is important, where it says make unconstrained variables non-negative we don't want to have negative returns. This here must be at least zero or above zero. So that's why we have to have them non-negative. You can leave it at GRG non-linear. There are options, but here we're using GRG non-linear. And then all you do is click solve. And then it's going to give you this here letting you know solver found a solution but you have to click ok to accept it if not it will erase it so click ok and what we have here so 100 percent there no problem now notice that it says put this percentage in walmart stock this percentage of money so more, more, over half of it is going to coca-cola and that's how here now american airlines for some reason it said nope it's not worth it uh, just don't put any money in it in order to lower the standard deviation and still have a positive return. So in order to get the lowest standard deviation according to all these numbers, this is how you allocate your money on these assets. So notice here on the description, I have MVP. That means minimum variance portfolio. That It doesn't get any lower than this is what it's telling you. With the stocks that we have, it doesn't get any more than this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this piece here. And I'm going to paste it, but the, only the values. You see that? Just the values. So I'm going to click on that. And I already got a preset to where it starts showing on this graph. So that's our first dot. That is the minimum balance portfolio that we have. All right. Then what we're going to do now is start building the efficient set by increasing the standard deviation limitation by a quarter percent. I'll explain that in a second. The first thing you want to do every time you're done with one step, delete this. Excel will get confused. So just delete it, make sure it's blank. And all I'm going to do is going to go back to the solver, is already preset. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add, uh, now I'm going to change. I'm going to change something and add something. So now from this point on, my set objective is the portfolio returns and I want to maximize it. Now I want to maximize my return. These I can leave the same, but I have to add something here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it that the standard deviation, I need it to be equal or less, then I'm going to say 3.25%. Now, the reason I chose that, we're just doing quarter percent up. That was close to 3%, so 3.25 is fine. So we took the, again, the standard deviation, and we want it to be equal or less than 3.25. In other words, do not exceed 3.25. I'm going to add that. Oops. Let me just hit OK. Let me cancel. One second. So now that's showing here. The 3.25% is showing there now. So that's all I did. I changed this to maximize the returns. And not to exceed 3.25% of standard deviation. Everything else stays the same. Hit solve. And it shows this again, I hit okay. 
to accept it. And I'm gonna continue that process of copying and pasting. Now notice how the dots start to build up. Again, always, always, always delete that. And now it gets easy because we can leave everything the same and all we do is change this. We have a change option. So now I'm gonna change it to 3.5 because I'm going up a quarter of a time. Check here, shows, hit solve. We get this again here, hit okay. Notice how little by little that efficient frontier, as we discussed before, is going to start showing that curved line that goes that way. This first dot was our minimum balance portfolio. And there we go. Okay, once again, delete this. Solver. Let's go ahead and change that now to 3.75. Hit OK. Shows there. Hit solve. Hit OK. And our dots are taking good shape now. Creating the shape, I should say. Blank the blue cells. Back to solver. Change. I'm going to go to 4% now. Be annoying sometimes. So my standard deviation now should be 4% or less. I know it makes sound every time, it makes sound. Now we have our new numbers here. Let's do a couple more. Or maybe I want to go up to 5%. So I'm going to change. Uh, I did something wrong. Oh, okay. I got to select it. I got to change it. 4.25%. Okay. Solve. Okay. Paste just the values. Fishing Frontier coming along. Solver. Hit OK. Just going to do a couple more so we can really see how it keeps on building. Always delete these. Let's change it to 4.75. Okay. Hit OK. There we go. And let's finish it with 5%. And if we were to continue with the percentages, you will see how, or you can do percentages in between these as well, but all you'll get is more dots in between. But you can start seeing how the efficient set starts taking shape. Maybe you just reminded, but that is the same as you saw before we spoke about the Markowitz efficient set. They not, don't always follow the same shape, but the same curve idea works well that way.
And that's how you can use Excel to identify the efficient set of portfolios you can achieve given a specific uh, uh, set of stocks and how they behave with the market. Okay, we will stop the video here.